Jesus Bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one Who guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh, God Well, the message this morning is about being fruit bearers. In other words, we're to be fruity people. <laughs> and we can't do that without Christ. We need Him. We need Him so that we can bear fruit one with another. And for His glory and for His honor. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, is the passage of Scripture we'll read and look at in just a few moments. From God's point of view, your purpose and my purpose is very simple. We, we live in a complicated world, and sometimes our lives get very complicated. Our work, our relationships, our travels can be very complicated. But life is designed to be very simple. Just as a grapevine must do, the main purpose of our lives is to produce fruit. Even more fundamental of a lesson is that we must never forget 
that the owner of the vineyard is in charge and the owner is in control and is focused on receiving the fruit from his vine. And you and I are the fruit that is produced from the vine. And God is the vine and he is controlling of the entire great process. So how important is it in John's teaching of John 15 to remember the when of this passage? Because Jesus had just washed the disciples' feet and he went through a, a final meal with them, instituted the Lord's Supper, and is now on the walk to Gethsemane. And yet where he will soon pray and be arrested, and he took an opportunity to talk to the disciples about fruit bearing. In John chapter 15, 1 through 8, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. He prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are always already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. And the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch that withers. They gather them, throw them in the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done to you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Now when you look at this passage and you look at the purpose of a vineyard, or you look at a purpose of a fruit tree, or you look at a purpose of something that is intended to, blend, to, to bloom, what is its main goal? The main goal is not just to be noticed that it sets out like any other vine or tree or bush. It is to produce fruit. And so the whole idea is that you and I are designed from the very beginning to produce fruit. We are designed to be fruity people. We're designed to, to display the, what is good about the vine. We are created to be an image of that which is, that gives us the nutrients to bloom. We complicate it trying to work out those details ourselves, And we try to, to make it even more beautiful or we try to add a little bit of extra um, miracle growth. And it just doesn't happen because we're not the controller of the fruit in which we bear. It relies and in, is always rooted in the true vine, which is God himself. And so you and I are on a timetable, a timetable with Jesus. <clears throat> he was using care with every word. And just then, he used an object lesson from a garden to describe the importance of what the disciples were going to continue to do when he is gone from their presence. And yet, the vines of that day were just beginning in the season of growth. The signs that a gardener or a, a vine dresser, however, would have been clearly obvious to anyone who was used to seeing all that come into bloom. The vines would have been tended, they would have been pruned, they would have been cleaned, they would have been tied to the arbor. And yet the season of growth would have them in a season of care and would have them be in a prelude moment for a season of harvest. So the good news is that God has created the vineyard. He's created the vine. And he says, we are a part of that vineyard. We are a part of that vine because we are now the extension of that vine called the branches. And the whole idea is for it not just to be a pretty vine, but it's to be a very fruitful vine to be used for purpose. 
There's a tale of an older woman who had finished shopping and she returned to her car. And as she approached her vehicle, however, she saw four men inside her car. The increasing crime rate in America, you know, disgusted her anyway. And she had long prepared for this very moment. And yet she dropped her shopping bags. She reached into a purse. She pulled out her handgun and she began to scream, I have a gun and I know how to use it, so get out of my car. The men didn't wait a second. Their doors opened, bodies started flying out the car. Four men ran as fast as they could of the gun-toting grandmother. And despite her Clint Eastwood imitation, the woman was shaken by the experience, obviously. She got into her car. She grabbed her bags, got into her car. She kept an eye out for them that maybe would return back to her car. She put her gun back in a purse. She got her keys hands shaking. Finally, in a moment when her hands quit trembling, she tried to put the key into the ignition and it just wouldn't fit. <laughs> and in time, she took, <laughs> she took a better look at the car and she noticed it looked familiar, but it wasn't the same car. Four spaces down was her identical car. Well, according to the story, she transferred her groceries to her own car. She drove to the police station and she turned herself in the desk sergeant, whom she told the story to, just fell out of the chair laughing and pointed to the end of the counter of four very frustrated men who were reporting a senior adult carjacking. She made an apology and no charges were filed. Be sure to know that you, you must know what you own and be prepared to be embarrassed if you don't. Well, you and I are a part of someone who owns a vineyard. And it's sometimes we can embarrass the vineyard. But that's not the intent of the story. The intent of the story is to know where we belong, to know how we are attached, and to know what our purpose is of where we belong and how we're attached to do for one thing for the Lord Jesus, and it is to be a fruit bearer. For him. It is to shine, to be tasteful. Now, I love going to the grocery store. I love how they've got it all designed. Most grocery stores, when you walk in, is the produce section. It's right there. You can smell a lot of the, the, the fruit as you walk in the door. And I love going through there and then watching how the fresh vegetables start coming out this time of season and, and, and the, the bananas and the apples and the oranges and the kiwis, all those, all those fruits that are just displayed, waiting to be grabbed. Well, think of this. The, the harvest is ready. The harvest can be seen by God. And the exciting part is, we are the produce for others to see and to enjoy. Ready to pick <laughs> and ready to enjoy the juiciness of the fruit. Know this as we learn a few things from Jesus about this story. First of all, what we learn from Jesus is that the vineyard belongs to God. The vineyard belongs to God. He says there is no mistaking this principle. I am the vine and you are the branches. And at the very, very beginning of the passage, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He is the vine presser. Yet he is the owner of the vineyard. It seems that all of us are born from time to time with those, those um, uh, selfish instincts. You know, like a child or a toddler who, who begins to, to understand when you hand him a toy, he or she, they'll say, you know, can I have it back? And they'll say, no. <laughs> or if they're holding on to it and you say, can I hold it a minute? Mine. They learn no and mine pretty fast. And it's interesting how no and mine stays with us all throughout life. You know, screams from a little child that the battle goes on when they say mine. It wouldn't matter if the object was a piece of trash or if the object was a, 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 a butter knife. Whatever it is, it's price, a priceless work of art. Once the hands are on what was given to that child, it is theirs. It is mine and you don't want to let go of it. Little children can't comprehend, obviously, the value of things. And someone 
you know, works hard to buy a work of art, but a child, if you give it to them, don't matter how valuable it is, it's just mine. Children can't understand responsibility. They can't understand time and earnings and value, but they immediately understand the concept of possessions. We don't grow out of that. Just because we have a third, third birthday or we have a 30th birthday, we don't grow out of it. By the time we're 50 or 70, we still have not grown out of it. Once we get our little grubby fingers on something, we say, it's mine. But God, it's mine. But God, that was my good health. It's mine. I want it back. I don't feel like this. I don't want this disease. I don't want to have to go through these treatments. I'm scared of surgery. I want my health back. My health, it's mine. Give it back to me. But God, I earned the money. Why did the stock market do what it did? That was my retirement. It was mine. But God says the man in the fresh grave of his wife, she was mine. I want it back. But God says, but we say, but God, the mother staring at the room of an empty 18-year-old son who's now gone off to college, I want him back. He's mine. But God, says the young adult, this was my future. I planned it. I worked for it. I went to school for it. I made all the promotions. This was all mine. I don't want to change in midstream. I want it back. It's mine. But God, says the church member, I gave years of my time to the church. I gave thousands of dollars to the church. I've sweat and, and, and worked countless hours helping the church. Now it's changing. It's not what it was. This was my church. I want it back. No, says God to the two-year-old in all of us. It wasn't yours ever. She wasn't yours. He wasn't yours. The church wasn't yours. You're not even yours. It all belongs to me. I am the vine and you are the branches. And from the very moment God issues that first of the Ten Commandments, he told us that he was a jealous God, that he would tolerate no other gods in our life and he would never relinquish the right to be God. In the vineyard, we find another opportunity to realize that God is in control, that God is in charge, and we are not. As much as we would like to bear the fruit, as much as we would like for the fruit to display itself, it cannot display itself without being connected to the true vine, and God is that vine. Obviously, in a garden, the branch doesn't tell the vine what to do. On a farm, the plants don't tell a farmer how to do its job. Can you imagine a plant telling a gardener? No, I'll do it my way. No, the gardener is going to do it his way because he knows what's best for planting, cultivating, pruning, and, and cutting, and removing, fertilizing, watering, spraying, and all those things. But a good plant simply trusts the gardener. And for you and I to bear fruit, we must trust the vine. We must trust the source of the vine. And in order for the fruit to bear its fruit as way God intended it to bear, it has to always remain with the vine. If it's not, it's like being cut off, thrown away in a fire, and is useless. So there may be no harder principle to put into practice for our lives today than this one, that the vineyard belongs to God. We all, need that ha we all have that need in our life to control. It's mine. It's the way I want to do it. But God is the owner. He controls it all. If we feel better, if we're in control, just like if four adults are in a car and usually at three, three in the car saying, I should be driving, we've got to give up that control. When it comes to our spiritual notion of bearing fruit, the bad news is the Lord demands <clears throat> that you and I release that control. There is no option. You and I have no more right to tell God how to do his business than a plant has the right to tell the gardener all the instructions. It just doesn't work that way. So that's the bad news, but you have to get the control. The good news is that means that you and I do not have to carry the weight of being in control. You don't have to carry the weight of the branch. Your job is only to bear fruit. Why? Because we're connected to the vine. So God is the owner of the vineyard. Jesus was very clear 
as he was talking to his disciples. A second thing is that Jesus, we learn from Jesus is that God wants us to, to as, wants as much fruit as possible. He wants as much fruit as possible. It's impossible to miss. Our job is to bear fruit. That is our job. Our major application point of this lesson that Jesus has given us is overwhelmingly simple. The purpose is to bear fruit. And the mission of our life is to discover how we go about that process. This message is an excellent opportunity to ask the question, God, why do I exist? Why, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Why was I ever born? This is the season we look at in our life. And if you haven't already found it, and you do exactly what Jesus says, you'll understand that it is by design, by purpose, that we bear fruit, that we bear that fruit. And God wants as much fruit as possible. He doesn't want to prune the bad branches. He doesn't want to get rid of. He wants every branch to bear that fruit. He wants every one of us to understand that our job is to be the produce for all the world. It is our job to entice people to want that fruit. And you and I are to be those fruit bearers. Number three is, is bearing fruit is a lifelong effort. It is a lifelong effort. Though we may, be, we may assume that bearing fruit relates only to something like evangelism, where we share our faith and someone comes to Christ. You know, the idea is not reserved to one single individual who hears another person pray a prayer, Lord, save me, for I am a sinner. That's not just the fruit bearing we're talking about. It's needed, absolutely. We need people to be converted to Christianity, yes. It's not just about seeing someone baptized as a convert. Everyone in the church plays a role in fruit bearing with each person exercising his or her God-given ta talents and gifts, spiritual gifts that God has given us. People with the gift of evangelism must, must be about the work of bearing the evangelistic fruit. But people who have the gift and the fruit of Teaching must be about teaching. Those who have the gift of hospitality need to go about bearing fruit in hospitality. And you put all those in place. So we need all of those, and our job is simply to bear fruit. And it is a lifelong process of being involved in an individual's life. So as we accept Christ, whether we're a child or whether we're a senior adult, do we get the credit for bearing the fruit? No. It is the result of being connected to the vine and that vine living within the fruit and the fruit affects those around them and we draw people to the vineyard. We draw people to the vine so that they get connected as we are and join the, the entire crop so that we can all be fruitful together. It's important to have the right tools if you're going to have a fruitful life. According to a story, a psychologist in Stanford University once tried to show that we live for productive results or what Jesus referred to as we, we live to bear fruit. This researcher hired a logger and said, I'll pay you double with what you are getting paid in the logging camp if you'll take the blunt end of the ax and just pound on this one log all day long. You'll never have to cut one piece of wood. He said, sure, I'll be glad to make double the money. And he began, and he took the blunt end of the ax, and he hit it as hard as he could, and he did it for half a day, and then the man quit. The psychologist asked, why did you quit? The logger said, because every time I move an ax, I have to see the chips fly. If I don't see the chips fly, it's no fun. Jesus didn't simply command that we bear fruit. He promised that the gift of the Holy Spirit that is within us is a gift that each of us that is distinct for each of us as a member of the body of Christ. While some may have the gift of evangelism, some have the gift of teaching, some are natural born, even supernaturally born, greeters, comforters, and etc., the gift of counseling, the gift of administration, all those together, the mix of those gifts means that none of us should try to create 
a carbon copy of another person's work. Instead, develop your God-given gift and bear the fruit that God intends you to bear, representing what you're connected with, which is the vine. And Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now branches bear your fruit. A complicated story? No. Simple meaning? Yes. Or we could be like the frustrated logger who says, if you find teaching a Bible class to be a very frustrating experience, then quit cutting the wood with the blunt end of the axe. Do the thing that you are called to do. Don't try to be a carbon copy of someone else. Consider the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Yet, in fact, the men's been studying that and learning from Bob all those characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. When you pull this off, aren't you bearing the fruit? If you pull all those things away, are you bearing the fruit? I don't think so. When Jesus gave the basic principle, the simple command, and he said in just a few steps away from the vineyard, he said, love one another as I have loved you. This happens to be the very first fruit of the Spirit. To love in such a way that there are ways in which all the other parts of the fruit begins to be enjoyed. Titus chapter 3 verse 14 says, Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good, maintaining those good works, it says, in order that they may provide for daily necessities and live and not live unproductive lives. In Titus, it talks about the same thing, that we are meant for uh, maintaining those good pleasures for God so that we are productive and we draw others unto that pro productivity. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He, the righteous man, the righteous man, is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whether he does prosper. So do you realize the joy of this? Every thought, every action, every attitude can be a good work, another grape in the cluster of being a produce for the vineyard. By these things the Father is glorified. So if someone is, is bigger, if their grape gets a little bigger than you being a smaller grape, now, if you've got a weight problem, you want to be the smaller grape, but that's not what we're talking about. If someone becomes a bigger, plump grape, the little grape is not jealous of the big grape. We're all one cluster together representing the one vineyard. And so we join in rejoicing with those because who is being glorified? The one plump grape, the cluster grapes, but no, the owner of the vineyard which is God himself. If it's only for winning people to Christ, if it's only for the few moments of getting a good pat on the back, then that's one thing. But if you and I dive into this understanding that the owner of the vineyard has put it in place for a major harvest and all these little grapes inside that vineyard have its purpose, to produce a great harvest together, then that fruit bearing that is intended for the individual purpose becomes a fruit bearing for the large majority and the mass called the church. Bearing fruit, however, requires a lifelong commitment and it takes work. It takes discipline. No plant casually produces a lot of fruit. Instead, it's a slow process it's a structured process. It's a process that produces fruit only in a season. You ever drove by someone's yard and you say, man, they always have the prettiest yard. It's always the green grass. They always have these colorful flowers. But you know what? how that happens? When it's 30 degrees outside, the owner of that yard is on their knees pulling weeds in the wintertime. They're repurposing plants deep in the ground that you can't see. They're fertilizing flowers so when the season comes, they begin to blossom. 
And so the, the understanding is that our work and our discipline will never stop. We have to stay connected to the vine. That's why self-control may be listed as one of the last aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Perhaps it's the top of the tree and the most difficult fruit to harvest. And so you and I are challenged to, to be a part of this fruit bearing, which is a lifelong process. In every garden, in every vineyard, there's an opportunity to be discouraged. Weeds thrive, insects come, mildew flourishes, disease happen in, in, out, in, a, in an outdoor home. And in every life, likewise, there are elements that can hinder the productivity of us being the fruit that God intended us to be. It would be easy with all the negative elements in our life to become discouraged in the midst of this vineyard of John 15. It would be easily easy to quickly say and conclude, I can't do it. There's too much guilt. I've tried it before. It's frustrating. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I don't want to bear this anymore. If so, listen to the wonderful truth. If you let the vine dresser direct your path, you'll not be tired of the work of bearing the fruit that the vine dresser has. You'll not be stressed. You'll not be confused. You'll simply bear fruit and you'll enjoy being fruity. Think of the object lesson Jesus used. Have you ever seen a grape vine that was stressed out? Have you ever seen a cotton plant that couldn't decide whether to bruise cotton or a banana? Could you imagine a blueberry bush crying in your bedroom, banging its little blueberry fist on your bed, crying out, I just can't do this anymore? No. Those kinds of things just don't happen because plants produced fruit naturally. You are the branch. I am the branch. God is the vine. It is natural for us to bear the fruit. Yet, they have the wonderful, loving, guiding hand of the gardener. And they don't have to do anything except do what they're designed to do. The gardener's taking care of everything else. Just bear the fruit. Frankly, if you're exhausted in your life's work, you may be in the wrong line of work. Healthy branches don't get stressed. They simply bear fruit. They may be trying to make bananas come out of apple buds, but it just won't work. You may be stressed because you're doing something unnatural. Would, it, would you like to bear the right kind of fruit and not worry about having the right tools, the right gifts, the right timing, the right calling? God's put it in place as he's walking with his disciples on the way to Gethsemane. He says, let's take a moment and think about this vineyard process. Because the day is coming, because he already told him in John 13, the day is coming that I'm no longer going to be with you. And where I'm going at this point, you are not allowed to go. So therefore, I am the vine and you are the branches. The vine is no longer going to be seen and you're going to be connected to that which is unseen. So he says to them, don't worry about the process. Just follow the simplicity. The simplicity is if you're frustrated in your life, in your Christian life, in your spiritual life, it's no one's fault but yours. It is designed by example from the very beginning that we fall on our knees, we give our lives to Christ, we live for Christ by studying His Word, praying to Him, staying connected, meditation, thought, scripture, memory, connected to the church, connected with one another, friends of, of, of those who are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we bear the fruit for the kingdom of God and not for us. It is designed very simple. We complicate it. I remember when I first became a pastor, I would go into these bookstores. It was like, you know, it was like a, a person who, who was an addict on coffee, like, like Mary Rini was. No, I'm just kidding. I, I know she's going to listen to this message, so hello, Mary and Dave. Uh, but, you know, your eyes light up. If you go to a coffee factory and you love coffee, you're going to go, wow. You go to Hershey's factory in Pennsylvania, you're going to go, wow if that's what you really love. The same thing for any other 
a fruit or taste in our life. That's the way it should be. We should be wowed every morning knowing that we are an extension of the vine. And the vine's not going to sever the branch if it remains fruitful. So you have a guarantee as you remain fruitful for Him. You're a part of the vine. You're a part of the vineyard. And the vineyard is owned by God. And it's designed that we do what's natural and we bear the fruit. Danny Simpson lived in Canada. It was the year of 1990 and Danny was desperate. He didn't have the resources to survive. And so he was short on cash. He had to provide for his family. He was desperate. He was shorter on skills. He didn't know what to do. He ran out of time. He's running out of options. So Danny took a gun that had been handed to him through the years from his family line. And he had a gun. He went to a bank and he robbed that bank and he left the bank with $6,000 in that holdup. Danny wasn't very good at robbing banks. And he wasn't, you know, and he was promptly arrested because he didn't know what to do after he robbed the bank. And at the trial, two significant things happened. First, Danny was sentenced to six years in prison for the robbery. His opportunities to succeed in life dropped to minute proportions at that sentence. And second, as the courtroom looked closely at the evidence, folks who were in the courtroom realized that the weapon he used was a Colt 45 semi-automatic, the kind of gun collectors would slavate by looking at. It was dated back to 1918 when a semi-automatic weapon was hard to be found or even known. And its value was $100,000. So Danny, you get it? He robbed a bank for $6,000 when he was holding $100,000 in his hand. Danny already had what he needed, but he just didn't know it. You have what you need, and you as a branch are connected to the vine, and that's all you need. God will not ask you to bear a certain kind of fruit without equipping you to bear the fruit. God has given us His Word. It is the ultimate resource, and no matter the question, the answer is in the Scriptures. And you've got it. You've got more than you need. You're already ready for the fruit-bearing experience. What you may really need is trust, a reason to go back to the first principle and realize it's not about you. It's not about me. Jesus says, it's about me. That's the whole story of the vineyard. He said, this whole vineyard you're looking at, guys, is not about you. It's about the owner of the vineyard. And the vineyard, the owner of the vineyard is just wanting to, to produce fruit. And all he wants you to do, Jesus says, it's not about you. It's about me. Because I am the vine and you are the branches. You're just the branch. My father is the owner and not you. He'll make all the gardening decisions. He'll do all the pruning. He will call all the shots. And he was always right, and never should we doubt it. So the question is, are you joyfully living out your purpose? I could have saved you a little bit of time, I know. I asked that question a long time ago, especially since the heat really started working and I'm getting hot. <laughs> but are you joyfully living out your purpose? The purpose is not to create something new for the kingdom. The purpose is to just produce fruit for the kingdom, as every person in every generation is called to do. Are you committed to that? Sometimes fruit has bruises. <laughs> but you know, I've eaten a mini bruised banana, and it's just as good as one that's perfectly formed. I've eaten many soft apples that were really good and juicy maybe even more so than those who are firm and hard. I've eaten many a cantaloupe that has a little bit stronger smell when you open it than one that when you thunk it, it thunks back. <laughs> so 
the fruit may have scars and the fruit may have bruises and the fruit may think they're worthless, but fruit is fruit. And it's not about the fruit, it's about the vineyard and the owner of the vineyard and the source of the vine. And Jesus says, I am the vine and you are my branches. Produce me. Produce me everywhere you go. That's what he says to his disciples because he just told them, I'm not going to be with you much longer. And where I'm going, you're not going to go at this point. But I will come again. He says, but I need you to produce me. So go do a good job. But don't worry about how to do it. Just stay connected to the vine and you'll naturally produce the fruit. What a beautiful story. Now that I've given you introduction, you ready for the message? No. Are you joyfully living out your purpose? If not, get connected. If you feel like you've got a little sever in your branch, let God heal it. Let him reattach it. He'll do it. He knows what he's doing. We don't have to worry about it. He's the controller of it all. Thanks be unto God for the joy of being a part of the vineyard. Amen. Father God, we thank you that you grant to us the opportunity to just reflect on where we fit into the story that Jesus so beautifully describes for those 12 disciples. It beautifully gives forth truth and understanding in its simplistic understanding. And what our responsibility is, is just to stay connected to you. And if there's failure in our life, it's not because you were not connected to us. It's because we chose not to be connected to you. Father, forgive us where we failed you and help us to be replanted back in your vineyard so that we can join all the cluster of grapes to recognize and bring glory and honor to the owner of this vineyard. We thank you on who you are and the privilege of us joining you in such beautiful display of fruit. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. My friend, we're going to stand and sing a song of invitation. Uh, take my life and, and lead me, Lord. And as we, you know, that's, that's a simple, simple way of saying it. You know, if you want to bear fruit, just take my life, lead me, Lord. And I'm willing to, to join the many others to bear the good fruit for you. So let's stand and sing that as a song of invitation, a song of affirmation of our faith. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Oh